What is going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today on the Diesel Podcast. Now, today's episode came directly from our Discord server, which I've mentioned before in our recent episodes about what it is. So it's basically, if you're not familiar with Discord, it's almost like a forum, except we created it. So we made all the sections, and it's a place that we want our, our hardcore fans, people who are really passionate about diesel, to be able to chat with us, chat with each other, talk with our sponsors. Basically, one hangout where we can all just talk about our builds and things that we've learned, or maybe ask questions. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you're going to see a link in the description. You can click there, and if you have a smartphone, it's super easy to download you just use your email make your password it's free to join and if you're not watching on youtube but listening on a podcast app just go to the diesel podcast on instagram you'll see a link in our bio right there it just takes a, a few seconds to register and i want to see you guys there we just started it recently it's about a week and a half old and we've got 40 50 people on there and it's really cool i'm on there all the time and i love being able to chat with you guys see what you're working on so make sure that you do that now on Discord, we got a question about what could be a 600 horsepower recipe for a second gen Ram. And so today I'm going to ask Christian from BD Diesel what his recipe would be. And there's going to be some a little bit of variation depending on your elevation and, and some things like that, but there's going to be a core part of it. So he's going to answer that question and also tell us more about what BD has been working on. We've been seeing a lot of new parts that they're rolling out, especially for the Duramax trucks um, with suspension and just things that they looked at and, and wanted to be able to offer their customers solutions to just common problems that diesel trucks are facing. And he's also going to tell us a bit about what they're doing with their dealer network, which they've, they're being you know, really aggressive, being out there on the road, meeting with shops, chatting with different shop owners. And I know there's a lot of shop owners that listen and a lot of people who work at shops that listen to the podcast. And it's incredibly important that a manufacturer out there, one, values your business and two, supports it. Not all of them do. And so what BD is doing, I think, is great for diesel. It's great for the shops, and ultimately it's great for you as a truck owner when a manufacturer is going to support not just your truck, but the person who is installing the parts and working on it. So it's going to be a great conversation. All right, let's get to the podcast with Christian talking about the recipe and talking about what BD is working on. Christian, welcome back to the Diesel Podcast, and it's always fun to chat with you and be able to see what you guys are, are working on. And I've seen a ton of new things recently and before we get into that i know with ucc you know that just happened saw a lot of posts from you guys a lot of commentary on it I'm, i wasn't sure if you were able to go um or how much of the crew you're able to get there but just what your your thoughts were on the competition and and all the different trucks that were out there and just being able to kind of get back to normal and have events again yeah you know that that was a great thing about it um with ucc you know it was kind of really the big first event yeah uh, once everything's opened up and so yeah, we were really excited. I'm sure the competitors and even the fans were tremendously excited. Uh, and it's good to see that, right? Um, like you like you mentioned, getting back to normal. Uh, yeah. UCC is not ever normal. Uh, it's a little <laughs> outside that. But, uh, but it's good to see the competitors again, get those diesel juices flowing, right? A lot of exciting things. And, and uh, yeah, it's been a long time, to be honest, before we've seen that. So it's good to see that. So yeah, we actually had our uh, U.S. road team down there um us as canadians we uh we could travel down but we'd have to quarantine coming back up and and so it uh, presented some difficulties but uh but yeah all accounts i think everybody had a great time i know uh the marketing department was was busy trying to keep uh trying to keep everybody updated with uh with all the crazy news and the crazy aspects and and and, uh, and, and the actual event itself so they loved it well, it really, it ties into something that I had seen you guys posted. I think I saw it on Instagram and it was um, like a short video and the, the, like the, the outside sales team, the people that are traveling, there's, I think a Ram and a, a huge trailer and everything. And the video was talking about visiting dealers. And I wanted to ask you about that because I think it's really important. And you've mentioned, or you've mentioned it before with how involved BD is and wants to be not just with events and, and the racers, but also with the shops. And now that, you know, things, you know, here kind of, kind of getting back to the way that they used to be, how, how, you know, what you guys are doing with that, why it's so important to get these people out to shops, show them product and, and just what the whole dealer network consists of. Yeah, definitely. You know what we find the dealer network is, is quintessential to our business and, uh, and as it should be to any business, right? And so we put a lot of pride into our dealer network. Um, they're effectively partners, right? They are partners with us. 
uh, in this industry. And so it's really important for us to continue to touch base, uh, to continue to reach out. Because to be honest with you, some of the guys haven't seen our guys or our guys really haven't seen customers in, in over a year or over a year yeah. and a half. And, and we like to, uh, we really like to keep a pulse on our dealer network uh, for feedback, positive and negative. And so it's really important for our team to get out there, uh, not only present new products, new opportunities, new ideas, but to take that feedback back to headquarters, right? They are an extension of headquarters. And so it's, it's so essential that we get that feedback back from the dealers. Um, retail customers and users will give that feedback back to the dealers. And we need to pull that back, right? It, it really helps us uh, to create the best po uh, possible product possible. So uh, it's really good to see those guys visiting, right? And we get daily reports from our road guys, like every day, hey, uh, I just dropped into uh, US Diesel Parts, uh, right? Um, Gomer's there. So, uh, and we like to see those, see those reports. Yeah, hey, they're doing well, or they're struggling with a particular part or what have you. And, and then immediately we can jump on it and get on that phone and, and call up Mo. Uh, and say, hey, uh, what type of challenge do you have? Yeah, and I think it's it's also really important as well because a lot of a lot of these parts, somebody's probably well, more than likely not going to install it themselves. I know there's a lot of do-it-yourselfers out there that will tackle transmissions and turbos, but you know, the these shops are working on dozens of trucks, or you know, even more, you know, in a given week or or month, and so the the feedback they can provide with say how to install a uh, you know, an injection pump or a turbo kit or uh, maybe a question they ran into during install. I'm sure you guys can take that and then incorporate it into, you know, product instructions for the DIYer that's out there. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's the thing, right? And so I think now more than ever, we've taken a, a firm focus at, at feedback, positive or negative, right? Uh, our actual uh, theme for, for the first part of this year was uh, send out uh, surveys. Uh, to every single person that's ever touched our product, right? And to continue to survey because we want that instant feedback, right? It allows us to, uh, to continue to make great products, continue to service the customer. And if we're doing something great, tell us about it. If we're doing something wrong, also tell us about it so we can make great things happen, right? So it's really important. A lot of the friends that I have in this, in this industry are, are shop owners that, you know, through the podcast or just through time have gotten to know. And I think what you guys are doing is something that is incredibly important and not every company does it. And I know that there can be a disconnect that some of the shops might feel out there when they, you know, get a, they sign up with a distributor or they're looking to, you know, add product um, either to their shelves or to their website. And I mean, quite frankly, some companies don't care or mm -hmm. you call them and it, once they got your money, it's just like, it's done. And so I think, what you guys are doing for them, you know, obviously helps them tremendously in being able to talk about a product, sell a product, install it. But then also for the end users out there, they get the same benefit as well. So, you know, they have that, the confidence in it. And I, I think that's something that really grabbed my attention about that video. And also some of the other podcasts we've done talking about BD's involvement in the community and even in regional events, local events, races, things that are going on. It's, it's just so important for, uh, for the community and the industry in general. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The community is by far the most important, right? And we're here to support the, and grow the community. Uh, and again, it, it's not just about one singular item or a singular group. It's about a group in, in its entirety. Uh, and the diesel community is quite strong. We're kind of banded together. Um, and, that's, and that's, we like to support that. One of the other videos I saw, which was really cool, is uh, you were showing or walking us through the uh, the new machine shop, mm -hmm. and so I wanted to ask you on the podcast about about that and what it what it allows BD to do for product for you know quality control for just volume that you guys can do now. Yeah, definitely. So um, so we took uh, earlier this year we actually bought uh, roughly a, a twelve thousand square foot facility. So it's quite tall. It's actually 30 feet tall. And so if anything, we can go vertical. Uh, but, uh, but we actually moved our CNC shop from headquarters over to this new facility, which is, which is about 10 minutes away. Um, and it's really allowed us to expand and set that machine shop up into a, a cellular manufacturing plant, right? Um, in our previous location, you kind of make a decision, hey, I'm going to move a machine here, move a machine here. 
those machines can weigh up to 25,000 pounds. So you don't like to move them around all that often. <laughs> yeah. right? So, so now when we got a clean slate, uh, we can set them up in a cellular manufacturing environment so we can manufacture uh, components with minimal waste. Waste would be movement or, or whatever type of waste it could be, right? And so uh, we do have the additional capacity uh, to grow. We added uh, another horizontal machining center. Uh, I think I did discuss it into the, in, the, in the video. In addition, actually, just last week, we bought another uh, mill turn machine, which is pretty exciting. So it's our first of that type. So it's pretty fancy. It's a, it's a nine axis machining center. Uh, so it's going to allow us to do a lot more complex parts and, and kind of expand our product line, right? The challenge, uh, as everybody knows, this year it's been supply chain, right? Yeah. The more and more we can bring that supply chain in-house, the more control we'll have over it, whether it's quality, whether it's pricing, whether it's feature set, um, availability as well, right? So that's the most important thing. So we do find that the product that we make inside, and typically we make around 75 to 85% of all our product at our headquarters, at our facility. Um, all that stuff is made here and it allows us to rapidly make improvements. Uh, and like you talked about feedback from the customer, hey, it would be great if it had this feature set or this particular uh, boss is in the wrong location or what have you, then we can quickly pivot and add an adjustment. And so we have another revision in, uh, in a very quick time, right? Two to four weeks, we can get a revision and so on and so forth. So it's really about product development and making sure that product is top notch. Yeah, I can imagine with the tremendous growth, I think that uh, that the diesel industry has had and, and the, the, the want for parts and, and just the demand is so incredible over the last you know year plus that expanding this is going to allow you to also be able to you know, keep the shelf stocked or keep yeah. a distributor stock so people can get stuff quicker, which is it's got, always kind of been the name of the game. But I think especially now with just the volume increasing so much, we want our parts or we need them and we got to get them quickly. So that's that's a tremendous benefit. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, there's been, like you alluded to, there's been a lot of challenges in the growth, right? A lot of growth in the industry, whether uh, whether that's just due to uh, the shortage of new trucks. And so everybody's fixing up their older trucks or what have you. But there's been a tremendous amount of growth. and. Uh, it's an interesting challenge in, in trying to meet that demand, definitely. So our what's team is always working on it. What's really been surprising to me is, you know, for the longest time I thought, well, you know, this trend of going towards an older truck is just for simplicity. But you'd mentioned with newer trucks and availability, and I've you know, seen pictures of all these super duties that are just sitting there waiting for a computer and, they, you know, they can't get them to a dealership and people fixing them. It's just there's so many trucks that are on the road. It's like and we see companies and and see different things where they're just specializing in a couple year you know, range or a particular you know, generation of truck. But you guys offer things for every diesel truck. And so. I, I can imagine the challenges that you guys have had over the last year plus of, you know, there's there's probably a lot of second gen Ram owners that need things. There's a lot of, you know, a one to 04 Duramax, you know, guys sure. that, that need parts. And so it's really fascinating to me to learn more about that and see how the market is adjusting to be able to support people who are investing in the trucks that they have already or they're buying one and, oh, and they sure. yeah. going through it. Yeah, you wouldn't believe actually, uh, the number of first gen owners that came out of the woodwork, right? Wow. First gen stuff is is just uh, is pretty hot right now, and so it's kind of interesting to see that, right? And you see these ebbs and flows, right? Whether it's uh, whether it's supply chain disruption, whether it's marketing, whether it's trends and stuff like that. So it's kind of it's really interesting to see that. So I mean, uh, which I really love, right? That first gen uh, Dodge owner or that LB7 Dodge owner. He's probably the uh, the fourth or fifth owner of that truck, right? Yeah. So uh, it's really good to see a new owner of that truck and and kind of it's being passed down. I'm going to say generational to generation. It, it maybe it's not that intense, but because that truck's not that old, right? It's it's what is it, 30 years old or actually 20 years old. So uh, so there really is not a generation in there, but you get different age groups, right? Yeah. Right? That that guy who drives that LB7. Uh, right? He's going to be in that 20 year old range, right? Typically, right? And, and so they're getting into their first truck. And so you get a lot of that energy that this is my first truck. I'm going to do it upright. I want to do it how I want to do it, right? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I catch myself in that as well. I, 
uh, I'm always looking at, you know, different sites or different pages that sell older trucks and, and I'll find something and you, know, you can see the, the history of ownership on it. I don't know how that truck was treated by the previous owner, the previous three. So when I look at it, I'm not necessarily thinking about huge power. I'm thinking, well, what, what suspension components need to be replaced? What do I need to do for, you know, the injection pump or the turbo yeah. or you know, just all these different things? That's, that's where I go first when I'm, when I'm looking at them. And that's, I've seen a lot of new products that you guys have had. And, and you mentioned a lot of things with Duramax trucks and suspension. And now that those, you know, have kind of rolled out and we're seeing them more, I wanted to have you, you know, clue us in a little bit, give us some information on, on some things that you guys are doing to address kind of the, the maintenance or the reliability of, of some of these different generations of either Duramaxes or Power Strokes or Cummins trucks. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So we've taken a, a focus on our Duramax line and we really started to spend a lot of engineering time taking a look at some of the common failures. Like we talked about LV7, for example, and some of the early model Duramaxes. And, and everybody knows that the front end components um, are one of those uh, regular maintenance items, right? Yeah. And so we took a look at the, at the front end, the IFS, and, and really kind of dug deep on, on how we could actually uh, improve the overall offering of what's currently um, currently being offered, right? So it's kind of interesting. Uh, and so we took a look at it and say, hey, you know what, what what's in our wheelhouse? And the center link's in our wheelhouse, right? So for us, we really have a, a great experience with, with forging components um, and machining components. And so that's the first thing we tackled. So we actually forged uh, a new center link. It's kind of I-beam design. Uh, and it's actually, it's quite a bit stiffer than the factory center link. And really then supports, um, it really supports the end links. And so, um, and everything, everything comes together in a mechanism that it's a lot tighter, a lot stiffer. Uh, and so that's a regular item that we do see on these older trucks getting replaced um, very frequently, right? And we take a look at the market and we say, hey, you know what? We could probably improve something that's currently in the market. Uh, and there's an avenue for us and it's in our wheelhouse. And so we'll continue to focus on that. And so we have a lot of good ideas and some different, different things to come to market. We never like to come to market with a me too item. And so we took a look at something different and, and I think we've presented a compelling story on our product. What other products have been really hot, you know, say over the last couple months or that you think are going to be, there's going to be a lot of demand for, you know, say over the summer. Cause I think as the seasons change, what people are buying, you know, probably changes a little bit as well. And, and I was thinking about that. Is it, is it the you know injection pumps? Is it turbo kits? Is it um, you know tra I'm, I'm sure transmissions are always yeah. always a hot item. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure, transmissions um, are a seasonal item. Like uh, like yeah, as you know, you're not going to sell tons of transmissions in December, uh, December and January. But as the temperatures heat up and as people start moving around, that demand for transmissions definitely comes up. Uh, and the entire transmission market too has had a number of supply chain disruptions, right? Um, with the OEM lines shutting down early last year, taking a while, right? And, and we got to be honest, like a lot of those OEM lines do fulfill aftermarket parts. And so when they shut down, it has, it has a rippling effect. Yeah. Um, and so I, I do believe transmissions uh, will continue to see significant challenges with supply chain. Uh, and thereby, inversely, you'll see demand go up, right? Just because they're tough to get. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Turbochargers as well, too, because people start moving around. Turbochargers uh, have been less seasonal. Uh, they're more continuous. Uh, but yeah, turbochargers are always, uh, always a big seller. Uh, and again, too, emission certified stuff, carb certification, EPA um, compliant parts are always a hot topic and are continuing to be a hotter topic right now. So I just actually thought of something and it was, uh, recently we had, uh, started a, a discord server for mm -hmm. our fans to be able to join, which is really cool. Yeah. And someone on there had asked, he's got a second gen truck and, and I thought I would you know, pose this question to you because BD offers so many of these components, but it's completely stock. And it's something that he's looking to get about 600 horsepower out of. So he's looking for a recipe and it, it's an automatic. So we, we know the transmission is going to be part of, of that. But I wanted to ask you, what would you recommend for somebody that's looking for that 550, 600 horsepower, 98 and a half to O2 truck to be able to, 
uh, you know, daily drive it. I don't know how much he's going to be towing, but I assume there's going to be some. And sure. just kind of be in that power range for air, fuel, and the, the powertrain. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so that uh, so that's, uh, we'll say a second gen BP44 truck, so around 600 horsepower. Uh, so that's a fairly common um, horsepower kind of goal for a lot of these guys, right? You're not past the BP44 stage, right? That's the one concern. Yeah. Some guys are going to ask for something greater than the BP44 can deliver. And then complexity just kind of snowballs, right? And so typically we try to, do you really want to go to that level? Because it gets quite complex past that point, right? So um, so yeah, in those situations there, you're going to be into a multi-disc torque converter, uh, obviously a built, um, uh, a built transmission. Uh, and then coming up on turbocharger size, the turbocharger size, depending on what the altitude is of the individual, right? If I can assume he's at sea level, uh, then that horsepower requirement is probably going to push him into something around a 64 and a half inducer size. I wouldn't want to go any bigger than that, especially if he's at altitude, right? Altitude is, is kind of uh, a, a, a tough challenge. Yeah. Right? Um, just because you start to lose that instant response, that spoolability, if so, if he's towing, you're going to run into some challenges there, right? So it's a it's an interesting thing when you talk to somebody, say in Colorado or Utah, versus somebody's on the coast, right? It's it's a different thing, and you actually have to size the turbocharger accordingly because you're going to suffer in the bottom end. And typically, um, typically, like we try to build turbochargers that really perform off the line because when you take a look at how you're driving your truck, how yeah. you're driving your vehicle, off the line is really where you want that really where you feel the seat of the pants improvement. Like I can give you great power at say 2,900 RPM, but at that point you're not using much of it, right? And so yeah. we really want to optimize that power range down low where you can really use it, where you're towing, where you're leaving a light or, or, or you're daily driving some of these roads, right? And so that's where, uh, if anything, we like to shy in this particular customer based upon his altitude, you're 64 and a half down to 63-ish. Uh, some of the Borg Warner SXEs perform excellent at that level. Uh, definitely, right? So, and he's going to have to get himself into uh, a pair of injectors as well, too, to get up that horsepower level. So, um, we do have horsepower levels of injectors that would fit nicely into there. And actually, they're super cost effective. They're not like the expensive common rail set. Now, as far as the VP44 itself, is is a, a stock one capable of, of getting to that 550, 600? horsepower range or do they need to be modified to support the amount of fuel that needs to be delivered for that yeah that so power? that's an interesting comment right so i think i think you're going to be the, the outer limits of the vp44 up there right and the challenge is is depending on whose dyno you're going to dyno at yeah. if you're, and we joke you dyno at our canadian dyno there's there's a conversion factor right uh like the currency right <laughs> it'll be a little tougher to get to that number but if, you, if you're looking for 600 on a on a conservative dyno, then yeah, that VP44 will support that. Uh, we do offer a high performance VP44. Uh, and typically the top number changes marginally, not a tremendous amount, but it does shift the power band, right? And it moves the power band around. So uh, there is an advantageous there. Dollar for dollar, uh, for, for this particular customer, depending on our budget, you could probably get away with, with a standard VP44. Uh, a set of injectors, obviously some sort of tuning box, whether it's an edge, edge is pretty much the standard in those particular trucks. Um, and then a turbocharger and then a built multi-disc transmission. As far as the, the, the valve train would, that power range, you know, would they want to go with a, a set of upgraded valve springs, maybe some head studs <clears throat> just for insurance, or do they not have to get into that quite at that power level yet? Yeah, I would, I would, I would say no to the valve springs. Uh, we've done that number all day long without the needing of valve springs, right? Um, and typically from what we've seen, uh, the need or the requirement for valve springs is based upon RPM, not based upon uh, boost levels. Okay. Uh, so if he is adjusting the RPM or he's changing his camshaft, right? There's a need then to take a look at the, uh, to the valve springs, right? So, um, Head studs, head studs are always, always a great thing. We always recommend head studs, especially because this 98 to 02 truck is probably up in the mileage department. Like we're not talking like it's got, uh, it's not a spring chicken, right? So it's probably going to have over 200,000 miles on it. Um, and so that factory head gasket has probably been worked pretty hard. Um, challenge, we always, you can do it. 
you can change the uh, head studs without pulling or damaging the gasket. Um, but it's, it's one of those things. Everybody has a different opinion on it, but, uh, we'd always recommend head studs. It's just going to save, it is insurance, right? Yeah. It's going to save the unfortunate thing that, uh, that unfortunately you're going to blow a head gasket, right? And unfortunately, um, combustion pressure is directly related to horsepower, right? So, uh, the more horsepower you have, the more combustion pressure you have. Well, I know he's definitely going to appreciate the the recipe for his 600 horsepower build that uh, we just got. It, it just popped in my mind. I'm like, I got Christian on right now. You guys have a ton of different products for for Ram trucks, and uh, yeah. you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this one throw this one out to him. Totally. Uh, what uh, one of my favorite things to do whenever we chat is to always ask you what's coming up, and then uh, there's there's always a lot of interest around what you guys do, and I yeah. think the whole industry, whether it's competitors or whether it's truck owners. They, they look to BD Diesel to see, well, you know, what are they working on or what news coming out? So I always like to get the the yeah. inside scoop on the podcast. Yeah, for sure. We got a lot of great competitors that come out with great, uh, great products. So uh, I think industry as a whole, I think we do a great job. I wouldn't say that uh, we set the standard by any means. Um, yeah, so we're going to continue down that Duramax line. Uh, I think there's opportunities that excite us there. Uh, and so we'll continue taking a look at some suspension pieces. Uh, some opportunities where uh, where we feel that it really hits our wheelhouse and we really can deliver a quality product. Uh, in addition to that, we got some great turbocharger stuff actually launching uh, probably, actually, it may get released at SEMA this year. That's probably a great conversation as well, too. Um, but uh, but yeah, we got a number of turbocharger kits that are going to be released probably for SEMA that you're actually going to see. So uh, probably two or three kits uh, for a variety of vehicles, not just not just the Ram either. So, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, in addition, more ter- uh, more transmission components again too. So, uh, we got a pretty big team here and and research and development, and so we continue to go on and and of course we're going to expand the dealer network side. Not real sexy for the end user, but that dealer network experience. And which effectively supports the end user, right? Yeah. The end user may take it for granted, but that supply chain uh, side of things is BD is really good at that. And we always take a look at how we can provide more value to the supply chain. And so really we have a good team focusing on supply chain uh, productivity efficiencies, right? Getting the product to your dealers or your WDs. And so you can get that product really. So BD is really trying to focus on getting that product to you as quick as possible. Right. The goal for us is one day you order it, you get it tomorrow. Uh, and we're going to continue to try to hit that. Uh, it is kind of a little bit of a stretch goal, but um, heck, if Amazon could do it, why, why cannot be? Oh, yeah. And we've gotten used to <laughs> we've gotten used to that as as consumers. And I know when I'm looking for something, even if it's not automotive related in the companies, you know, on the East Coast or someplace else, I'm not going to have direct contact with them. But if I can go on their site or call them up and they say, hey, there's a, a place, you know, 10 miles from me or 10 minutes, it it, it makes it so much, I guess I'd say comforting yeah. to know when I'm going to buy something, they have a relationship with somebody local to me that can get me the product or install it or just take totally. care of anything I need. Yeah. And that's the thing, right? And so there's there's an aspect of having that friendly face where you can pick it up. Yeah. Right, which a lot of us have missed with the e-commerce route. Um, but hey, if you're an e-commerce guy and don't don't really want to talk to anybody, we can we can help you there. But but we really value the ability when there's a face to face to contact to hand that part across the counter and said, "Here you go. If you got any questions, give me a call. I'll help you out." Right. Yeah. So, um, honestly, in the last year and a half, I, I think uh, I think everybody's missed that. Yeah, it's definitely. I, I didn't realize how much I did till do, like doing podcasts, doing them on Zoom now, where, you know, before it was just all on the phone. And and uh, I had uh, Lenny Reed on um, from Dynamite Diesel, and we did our first one on Zoom. And he's like, this kind of feels like we were internet dating. We're just seeing each other for the first time. And it, it cracked me up. And I thought, you know, that is something that, uh, it, you know, it adds another element, uh, you know, to these and, and, and helps with the, the conversation. And I was just thinking, you had mentioned SEMA. And you know, how, how cool and probably in a way how much we took that for granted is, you know, every year going to Vegas and it's this automotive extravaganza. And then it, you know, last year it it wasn't going on. So, you know, for this year, how are you guys gearing up for that? And and what are some plans you guys have besides say, you know, the, the product releases you had mentioned? 
Yeah, for sure. SEMA is always interesting, right? And so we take a look at it. Uh, it's a big process, actually. So those probably behind the scenes, we actually have to book our booth uh, coming up next week, looking at the date here. And so it goes by seniority. And so they say, okay, you can now pick, right, based upon seniority. So we take a look around and, and we pick a booth spot, right? Um, and, and so it's, uh, they call you between... <laughs> I feel like it's a cable repair man. They say they'll call you between the hours of 1.30 and 2.30 and have to be waiting by your phone to pick your booth, right? So it's it's a little bit of a lottery and, and you don't want to miss the call, right? Because then they pass over you. So it's it's kind of crazy that way. But yeah, so we'll pick our booth. And then once we got our booth design or our size layout, we have an idea what we're looking for. And typically we go for like a 20 by 20. Um and once we're once we're solid on our booth design, then we uh, then the marketing gears really start turning to see how booth layout works, right? And what we'll do is we'll actually lay out the booth downstairs uh, in the warehouse and take a look at it and see how functional it is. You know, how does it look? Is, is it customer friendly? Is it appealing for photographs? Can we support our staff inside of it? Uh, is it too cluttered? And then we'll go what product we want to display. Um, so effectively, we set up uh, SEMA twice, right? So it's a total dry run, and we give it a real good feel for it, and, and we discuss uh, different different colors, uh, what's the focal point, right? And then uh, then effectively, uh, two weeks before we ship everything down, uh, and everybody flies down effectively the uh, about four or five days before start date, and starts that whole process, right? SEMA's a grind, you know what? Um, I could say I've probably done it up teen times now i've probably done it 17 times and uh you know what after the second one i never looked forward to it i hate it i hate it. It, it is it's a great it's a great show but man oh man does it beat you to hell yeah that's well, a lot of work i mean it's yeah. you just mentioned that there's a lot of work done before you even get there and, and then there's so many people there and i'm sure tons of questions and there's yeah. it's just like sensory overload with all the trucks and all the things that are going on it's it's uh it's definitely you know, probably the marquee kind of, you know, just event that's out there to be able to see what people have been working on, new things that are coming out. And it's, it's always something I look forward to, to, to see, you know, what's released and kind of builds up interest for the next year, right after the holidays, you know, what's going to start hitting the market. Yeah, totally. And then the big thing, what we try to do, we try not to release vaporware. So some people have done that. They, uh, we always try to bring product that is ready to sell at that date. Uh, and like two years ago, we actually did product releases right at that show. So uh, say on the Wednesday, we released this particular product and you could order it right then and there. Right. And so that really takes a lot of, uh, a lot of development, a lot of planning to make sure, you know, the supply chain has the product and so on and so forth. So, so it was a different spin and we keep on trying different things. Right. Um, and that's what keeps it interesting. That's so cool you guys do that because one of my the things that I just can't stand is when I see a product and I want it and then it's like releases quarter two or quarter three the following year yeah. and I got to wait for it. Oh, totally. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. And there's a mechanism. There's a reason to that, right? They're trying to hold you off because you could have bought uh, another product and now now they have a hook into you, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I get, yeah, again, so there's a reason to do that, but uh, we try not to use that reason. Well, it, uh, it was great catching up with you, Christian, and, and I, I encourage everyone that's listening, if you're into diesel trucks, no matter what you have, definitely follow BD on Facebook, Instagram, your YouTube channel as well. There's a lot of great information, just knowledge that's there. Yeah. And, you know, I, I find myself watching the YouTube videos a lot to see you know, theory behind a turbocharger and how things are put together. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, there's a lot of great information and it, it's, uh, it's been cool to see, you know, the Duramax stuff you talked about before starting to roll out and some of the things with carb, um, testing and EPA testing, those things starting to, to hit the market. Mm -hmm. Um, and I actually just thought of something else to ask you. And, uh, before we wrap up the podcast is with, with these newer trucks and with the carb testing and with the things that you guys are working on, do you see, do you see the next evolution of diesel performance almost being to take these trucks with emissions compliant parts and being able to push that power level higher and higher and higher? So if somebody wants to go buy a 2021 or 2020, or 2022, whatever year it might be, 
and they have that desire to be able to take it to a track and have fun with it, that that's almost the new frontier versus how it used to be, you know, say with the older trucks and how things used to be done is, you know, you throw a bunch of air, a bunch of fuel, get the transmission going, get the suspension set up, go have fun with it. It's almost different now. And, and I've been really curious how the industry and the companies that are in it view you know, these 2007 and a half to current trucks and being able to deliver power and torque at a higher level than, you know, towing and daily driving to those truck owners out there. Yeah, I think, uh, like, I think we've mentioned this before is, is that the newer trucks, they're more complex, right? The older trucks, they were quite simple. Like yeah. you said, air, fuel, turbocharger, like, uh, like that great listener uh, with the second jet, right? Yeah. It's fairly simple. Um, 2018, 2019, 2019 Dodge Ram. Uh, it's complex, right? Uh, when we uh, released our uh, uh, back to the CP3 kit, right? There's a lot of things that you had to take into consideration, right? Not only space, like you open the hood, you're like, oh my gosh, like there's no room in here anymore. Yeah. Uh, but there's a lot more computer systems to monitor everything to ensure uh, the performance, to ensure the reliability, to ensure the health of the engine. Right. And so you have to take into so many of these concerns. Right. And so um, the customers are still going to have the want, the need to to have performance, to go fast, uh, to do special things with their trucks. Right. Keep in mind, like the big three, they design trucks to fit the uh, to fit the average consumer. Right. Are the diesel enthusiasts average consumers? No, they're fringe. Right. So they exist over here. Yeah. Right. So you can continue to target those fringe hardcore enthusiasts. There's, there's always going to be that, whether it's a 2021 truck or it's a 2010, right? You're always going to have that fringe customer. And that's where we're going to continue to deliver quality products, right? Because that's who we are, right? That's the diesel community. Yeah, if you take a look at the entire market as a, as a whole of all diesel truck owners, right? You have a large percentage that uh, just drive their truck. They got no idea, right? Yeah. Right? And, but then you have a, a smaller portion who are enthusiasts and that's who we are. We're enthusiasts, right? And that's who we cater to, right? And they have specific needs uh, that typically the big three uh, uh, don't understand or don't cater to because um, it's a smaller portion, right? And we're going to continue to cater to them. It, well, it's really, it's really uh, inspiring and cool to see the progression of it from, you know, when they first, these trucks first came out, there wasn't a whole lot. There was, you know, basic kind of things you could do to them. And I know at the heart of diesel and what got me interested in them a long time ago was seeing this production, you know, ramp truck, you know, at that time running tens was like, you know, it wasn't unheard of, but it was, it, it was definitely different. And I thought, wow, so I can go buy this truck and I could do this if I, if I wanted to. And, and that, that desire for power and torque, you know, hasn't gone away. And so I'm really excited to see, and I hope that it gets there one day where, you know, you can have an 800 horsepower emissions compliant truck or 900 or maybe more, who knows, you know, how fast things are going to progress. But I think that is, is something that, that excites me for, you know, all these newer trucks that they're not going away. They're going to continue to be built this way. They're going to continue to have to meet these standards that are set. And just to have that, that performance side, if we want to venture into it, if, if we want to do that with a newer, you know, kind of truck. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think you're going to see that. I think you may see engine displacement kind of tick up a little bit more as well too. Uh, as the horsepower wars, the OEM horsepower wars go up, I think yeah. we're, we're going to see, we're going to see some uh, displacement increases. Uh, and, and if you recall, recall what happened when we went from the five, nine to six, seven, the aftermarket was able to amplify that. Yeah. Right. Those increased gains. Right. And so, uh, so that's going to be exciting. Right. Um, Cause it, it just, it allows uh, additional power to be made. I always, I always like uh, throwing those questions out, not prepping you guys before you come on the podcast. <laughs> just throw oh, curveballs yeah, exactly. out there. So. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, awesome, Christian. Well, thank you again for your time today and uh, chatting with me and we'll, we'll uh, chat here soon and, and talk about some new products, new things going on here. Yeah, I'm just right around the corner. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let me know too is if you want to, if if I can prep for a screen share, I can show you a couple of the cool stuff that we're doing. Okay. Uh, we are prepping a video um, 
day in the life of like a BD engineer uh, and going through some of the processes that we do to really understand that uh, our process is a little bit different than most um, and to really go in what actually goes into actually making a product. So I think, I think it would be fascinating, especially um, if we could show it on, on your show as well too. Uh, I think I think your listeners or viewers would actually find it pretty interesting. Some of the technology we use. We'll do that. Yeah, for our next one is I'll uh, I'll uh, prep the audience a little bit, ask them for you know some things that they want to see, yeah. and then we'll incorporate that for you know the subscribers that, uh, that we have on YouTube and and uh, you know people who want to want to see what we're talking about and and uh, you know visualize a different thing. So yeah, we'll sure. definitely definitely work that into the next one. And good. Yeah, as as always, great to chat with you. Excellent. You take care. Don't forget, Diesel fans, if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure and check the description below. Join our Discord if you're listening on a podcast app. Just go to the Diesel Podcast on Instagram, and you can click uh, the link we have in our bio. It'll take you right there to register. It takes a couple seconds to get on. It's totally free to join. And I want to see your guys' trucks. I want to see the experience you've had building it, what your goals are. It's a great way to be able to you know, see what Diesel Nation is doing, and that's incredibly important to us. Until next time, keep the shiny side up.